Welcome back to the Groundless Ground Podcast, the leading edge of integrative mental health. I'm your host, Lisa Dale Miller. You can subscribe to, download, and review the Groundless Ground on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Stitcher, TuneIn, and of course, find out more at groundlessground.com. I'm ready to go. How about you? Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to Season 2 of the Groundless Ground Podcast. I'm very excited to launch this season by dialoguing with Doctor of Chinese Medicine, Elaine Duncan. For over 10 years, Elaine served as a clinician and researcher on the complementary medicine team at the Washington, D.C. VA Medical Center, treating war veterans suffering with combat PTSD and complex PTSD. Elaine has invented a truly unique approach to trauma-informed acupuncture, which integrates the neurobiology of traumatic stress, somatic experiencing skills, and Taoist five element theory. Her new book, The Tao of Trauma, co-authored with Kathy Kane, views trauma through this ancient, modern, integrative lens and lays out practical strategies for treating common comorbidities of traumatic stress, such as chronic pain, autoimmune illness, insomnia, metabolic problems, and of course, mental health disorders. And I know those of you like me who work with trauma are very used to working with patients that have one or more of these comorbidities. Our shared clinical history of treating active military and war veterans makes this dialogue with Elaine both practical and visionary. She uses clinical examples to describe Taoist five element theory and its correlation with somatic psychotherapy techniques. It's a really informative episode, and I hope you enjoy every minute of it. Elaine, it is such a pleasure to have you on the Groundless Ground podcast. Thank you very much. You're practicing a unique approach to acupuncture, which integrates the neurobiology of traumatic stress, somatic experiencing skills, and Chinese medicine. That's right. And you also have been part of the complementary medicine team at the DCVA Medical Center for over 10 years. Correct. Working with vets suffering with complex PTSD and combat PTSD. That's right. I ran a clinic at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 2007 and 8 for the caregivers, particularly the nurses and other clinical and administrative staff. Over the course of a year, we called it a Restore and Renew Wellness Clinic, a -a once-a-week clinic where people came in for acupuncture and body work Mm -hmm. to help them cope with the stress of giving, the stress of caring. You also are a researcher, so we are going to get to talk about your clinical research. And best of all, you have a new book coming out, The Tale of Trauma. And the book appears, from what I've seen so far, to explicate this unique integrative methodology. I'm a big fan of acupuncture's ability to target and lessen systemic inflammation and ANS dysregulation. Right. The Tao of Trauma is introducing frameworks and concepts and methodologies that many Western practitioners have no idea about. One place we should go first is to try to have you explain some of these terms that are very important for mixing trauma therapy and Chinese medicine. The first term is Tao. The title of the book, The Tao of Trauma, came to me while I was working with a group of veterans at the DCVA. We were treating them using ear acupuncture, and they would receive their needles and then sit in a circle, and I would meditate with them. So the name came to me while I was meditating with this group of veterans. Many people don't know what you mean by ear acupuncture. And the minute they hear needles, everybody cringes. Right. There are actual points, according to Chinese medicine, in and around the ear that do specific things. So maybe you could describe why you chose ear acupuncture, why you were meditating with them while they're getting treatment. Okay. Over the course of the 10 years that I spent working at the DC Veterans Administration, we developed an approach to acupuncture involving the ear. The ear has over 300 acupuncture points on it. There are many that are associated with autonomic nervous system regulation. I developed an approach that I call the 12 points for restoration and balance, where we used a electronic point locator to evaluate the intensity of 12 points on the outer ear. And out of those 12 points, we could select five that had the highest reading 
that would be uniquely helpful for this particular veteran's need to restore balance and regulation to their autonomic nervous system. When the meter is getting a high reading, is it detecting dysregulation? These are the points that are going to bring the greatest regulation to this person because these are the points that are the most dysregulated. You process your stress differently than I process my stress. We were able to choose the points that are going to be most helpful to this unique veteran. And then we would treat them for 10 sessions, and then we would retest them with an assumption that over the course of those 10 sessions, that their autonomic nervous system actually changed, that it became more regulated, and their need for acupuncture treatment would therefore shift slightly because they were evolving in the course of their treatment. We would place a, a circle of maybe 10 or 12 veterans would come for a session that would last an hour and a half. They would receive their needles and be taken into a state like meditation. The needles would usher them into a more restful, introspective state of mind and being. And I would sit with them and meditate while they sat with their needles. Physiologically, what you're describing, the points that you've picked activate sympathetic deactivation in the nervous system, which creates that feeling of calm. So this is very, very interesting. I don't know how the sympathetic nervous system can be shifted, except having more capacity for spontaneous deactivation into parasympathetic. If we go to Chinese medicine, sympathetic nervous system is parallel to what the Chinese call yang energy. The parasympathetic system is parallel to what is called yin energy in Chinese medicine. Yin is like rest and digest, and yang is like awake and alert. We need both. We need them to be in appropriate balance and tension with each other. Approaches that exclusively want to build parasympathetic restoration run the risk of inducing so much parasympathetic that people go into a freeze state. 15 minutes of meditation is good, well, so let's send you for a week-long meditation retreat. Not necessarily a good thing, not necessarily a titrated, helpful approach to regulating that nervous system because it needs a balance between both yin and yang, both sympathetic and parasympathetic. There are many people with trauma physiology for whom extended meditation is probably contraindicated. That's right. And there are people who have so much suppression of their sympathetic system that they're actually unable to defend themselves. You know, in a lot of trauma circles, the sympathetic nervous system gets a bad rap. It's the bad guys and parasympathetic is the good guys. And actually, we need regulation of both branches and harmonious conversation between the two. Yin is a receptive energy. Yang is active, dynamic energy. That's right. Now the Tao. What is the Tao? The Tao was seen by the ancient Chinese people as the origin of creation. It was the first impulse out of which everything else emerged. It's the force that unites all of creation. So if everything emerged out of this one primal source, the Tao, then everything is connected. When we are feeling coherent in ourselves, our emotions and our body and our physical expression are all one harmonious whole, then we're in our own Tao. And when our actions and behavior are in coherence with our community, where we're in a fluid flow of life in balance and harmony with our neighbors and our world, then we're in connection with the universal Tao. So there's a personal Tao and there's a universal Tao. Yeah, of course they're related to each other. The more that we are in a coherent state inside ourselves, the more our regulation and balance then influences the regulation and balance of the people in our household, our coworkers, neighbors, our friends, the more regulated we are, the more regulated they can be. The more that we can live from our own Tao, the more we influence the capacity of our world to live within its Tao. This sounds almost like it has biopsychosocial implications, an integrated personal system, also the collective system in which we live. That's right. There's research done by the heart math people. They use the term cardiac coherence. My cardiac coherence will actually influence the coherence of people in a six to eight foot radius of me. Chinese medicine would say the heart, which we call the supreme controller, sends a regulating message through its heartbeat 
through the blood influences in each beat my whole body and that regulating message in my heart also influences through the transmission of chi or energy the people that are in my environment the more that i'm operating from my dao the more i'm creating a harmonious dao in the environment that i'm in as the veterans were sitting in the circle with the needles on these specific points you were practicing some form of meditative practice would have some kind of co-regulatory influence over what was happening to each one of these veterans in their specific mind body system that is certainly my intent you know when i started working with military families back in 2004 or so I sensed a divide between myself and service members and veterans. That sense of division between us has evaporated over these 12 years. I have a greater sense of oneness with these veterans than I possibly could have embodied when I first started. There's a doubt within my capacity to connect with the service members and veterans as a oneness of humanity. There's a uniting experience of trauma that's in all of us. we are all impacted by the vibration of trauma in ourselves or in the people who we associate with and love it's part of the dao of life that it includes both regulation and dysregulation and we all play a role in the regulation and dysregulation of our world because we're connected through this energetic imprint is that getting too esoteric not for this podcast some of what you just said as i worked with vets for quite some time as well even though i've worked in war zones i think everyone who's not been to war has some feeling of i can't possibly understand what these people have been through so there is a sense of i'm different and sometimes they have that sense about us as well normally for those of us who've done this kind of work once you learn their terms their language you get a sense for the way the group coalesces the kinds of experiences the way they hold trauma in the military There is a level of understanding and a capacity to meet them in that experience that I think happens. That's right. You may have been referring to that when you said that over time you had more context, but I have a feeling you were actually referring to something else. Everything you say I resonate with. The other dimension was coming to appreciate to be able to see the profound love that they have for each other. The profound sense of I've got your back. that very few civilians have the opportunity to ever experience that is a ventral vagal experience i'm with you and you're with me and we're in this together and i'm going to take care of you and you're going to take care of me to be able to see that and witness that was a profound honor for me you know help me see these service members as something beyond what i thought a warrior was i didn't think of love but now i can see love that. what did you think of i thought of killing and war and brutality and degradation when you did this work with the groups was this just one study or was this a methodology that you continued to deliver to veterans at the VA so in 2007 when i started at the VA we had one group a week when i left the VA in 2017 we had 12 groups and we were treating between 60 and 80 veterans a week in the context of these groups the veterans told us that they had less pain that they slept better their mood was more balanced there were a number of profound stories about getting off opiates and getting off other medications finding more harmony in marriages and working out differences and all kinds of things that make life better my experience with the VA is they don't continue to support methods that don't work right except for some of those methods that are standard of care <laughs> right but at least when it comes to complementary methods they only seem to continue using methods that actually work you mentioned chi so we have the dao we have yin and yang how uh -huh. would you describe chi the most common translation for chi is energy think of it as the motive force that allows every function in the body to happen not only peristalsis in our guts supports movement of tissues and organs it also supports the longing that's behind a prayer the impulsive action of a ball's coming to me and i'm going to raise my fist and and grab it to conscious movements like a a tai chi movement or playing the piano chi is what allows all of those functions etheric and tangible to happen 
So when it comes to trauma, would you say that the chi is not affected more the method by which chi has mobility in the system? I describe trauma as dysregulated, disorganized chi. Chi is organized as tension between two poles, yin and yang, in neurobiology, sympathetic and parasympathetic. And it lives in a waveform that the Taoists noticed and described, day and night, winter and summer, inhale and exhale, heartbeat and heart rest. All of those dualities are expressions of the movement of qi between these two balanced poles of yin and yang. When the lightning bolt of trauma comes into this regulated system, when that is dysregulated by an overwhelming energetic experience, that dysregulation gets manifested as either an excess or a deficiency of yin or yang. The fundamental premise of Chinese medicine is balance between polarities, balance between opposing states. It makes acupuncture, Chinese medicine, an ideal approach to restoring regulation and balance because our fundamental clinical orientation is regulation between opposing states. The qi is energy. Yeah. So the qi itself does not become tainted. Correct. The qi itself can't be tainted. Within this model, when we hold that nature ordains this balanced regulation between yin and yang, waxing and waning of the moon, rising and setting of the sun, that we can stand on knowing that if we can help our patients find their connection back to this organic balanced regulation of qi, their system will find balance and regulation. The overlay of dysregulation caused by traumatic stress is simply an overlay. Inherent within them is regulation. People are not broken when they have a diagnosis of PTSD. They are simply awaiting re-regulation, awaiting the way to find their way back to a regulated state. Let's bring in the five elements because I am sensing that when you talk about dysregulated qi, dysregulation in the system, that this has something to do with the five element systems and how they are functioning or not functioning. When these ancient Taoists were teaching, the first thing they said was all of creation emerges out of the Tao. Then they noted that the Tao included these polarities. The Taoist primary instruction was that we should live in harmony with the movement of nature, that health was found by aligning ourselves with nature. Because these ancient Taoists were agriculturally rooted, their experience of the seasons of the year was an important organizational principle. They divided the agricultural calendar into five phases and named these five phases for the five elements and said that living in balance with these five elements is the way to live a healthy life. For example, in the winter, which is ruled by the water element, we are called to a more quiet and introspective life because nature teaches us it needs a time for reflection and quiet. The ground is frozen. There's nothing growing. It's a time of rest for the fields and that we too would benefit from taking a time of rest in our life. Similarly, in the spring, it's a time of rapid growth and pushing through the soil, mounting responses like the seed that's been held quiet all winter, all of a sudden sprouts and pushes through its hard exterior and, and manifests. So this is a time for mobilizing new ideas to spring forward, to emerge out of our minds. Summertime is a time for warmth, connection, playfulness, that's associated with the heart and all matters of the heart. Late summer is the time for harvesting lessons, harvesting fruits, harvesting experiences of our year, for resting and digesting. Autumn the, is the, associated with the metal. The metal is the time for both receiving the inspiration from the heavens, because the lung is the organ associated with the metal, and the colon is the other organ which is responsible for letting go of what's no longer useful, what's wasteful. Each of these elements has organs associated, emotions, tasks, including the five steps of the self-protective response. Five steps that were defined and articulated by Peter Levine are actually mirrored in the five elements of Chinese medicine. The organs themselves are not the same as organ systems in Chinese medicine. The organ systems in Chinese medicine have a much broader sphere of influence than their more linear understanding in Western physiology. 
The heart is known as the supreme controller. It sits in the center of the kingdom. It beats out a rhythm, a regular and steady rhythm that informs the rest of the body about the nature of the whole. When the kidney adrenal system signals threat through experiencing fear, and then in Western terms, releasing adrenaline and cortisol and other stress chemicals, it communicates to the heart, fear in the kingdom, and the heart then directs all the rest of the organs of the body to respond in their own way to protect the kingdom from threat. So this is very interesting because you and I could probably agree that our patients who suffer with PTSD and trauma often are having the kidney adrenal system signaling in the presence of a stimulus that is not actually a stimulus for fear. Exactly. Ability to discern safety and threat belongs to the kidney in Chinese medicine. So in Chinese medicine, acupuncture or qigong might be using some either movement or acupuncture to strengthen and regulate the kidney adrenal system. Correct. And this is actually why I feel Chinese medicine is such a great counterpart to SE as well as Kathy Kane's touch methodology. Right. This is an area that I believe your book thoroughly investigates and explicates unlike uh -huh. any other book I have yet to see. So when I took Kathy's touch skills training, the world of acupuncture kind of came alive for me in a new way because I was able to see the organ systems of Chinese medicine come alive through the touch skills that I was learning. And I saw discharge, release, a bound traumatic stress flow out of the body along meridian pathways. And it came to me that there was this whole bounty of touch skills that she had developed and taught that if I used the lens of the five elements, I could better choose which one of those touch skills was going to be most helpful for this patient. For example, a person who's very dysregulated in their metal element, lung and the colon are the two organs. So the lung is responsible for receiving the pure chi from the heavens. When what it receives through the breath is threat, that threat can get lodged in the respiratory diaphragm. And then in Kathy's system of diaphragms, impact all seven diaphragms because the breath happens like that. That's different than someone who experienced repeated thwarting of their mobilization response. They attempted to mobilize, but they were pinned down. They were unable to land their punch. They were unable to push their attacker off. That person thwarting is more in their sympathetic nervous system, and it's more actually in Chinese medicine in their liver and gallbladder, which belongs to the wood element and is responsible for mobilizing just like the daffodil in the spring mobilizes its flower. So I can use approaches that belong to this whole resonant field of the wood element for someone who's rigid in their body, rigid in their emotions, tends towards volatility and anger. I can help smooth out braced response in their sympathetic system, which is held in the organs and tissues associated with the wood element by using touch skills that relate to those associated corresponding tissues and organs. This is fantastic. It's I, pretty cool. I use targeted specific Qigong moves that I deliver to my patients to work the organ systems in similar ways. They don't have thwarting in the system, then clearly I'm not going to be giving them one of the Wudong eight moves for the liver. You get it. And I think the point that I'm trying to make in the book is that you don't have to be an acupuncturist to be able to make use of these distinctions that the Taoists describe and have been tested through thousands of years. Nature is the same. We may have abused her in certain ways so that it, she manifests a little bit differently, but her core organization is the same as it was when the Taoists first were instructing people about how to live. So we can make use of the interface between what the neurobiologists have been able to describe and put it alongside what the Taoists are able to describe and actually provide a broader platform to our patients. One of the things that I noticed immediately was that this did not seem to be a manual for acupuncturists. It seemed to be written for Western practitioners who may already be using some kind of touch methodology in their work. I think it's written for somatic therapists, somatic psychotherapists, for acupuncturists, because acupuncturists don't necessarily get this information in their acupuncture training. The acupuncture schools don't teach the impact of traumatic stress on the energy body. 
some acupuncturists will think that, for example, PTSD is one thing instead of understanding that there are nuanced ways that trauma impacts the body. And if you treat everyone using a formula for traumatic stress, you're only going to be helpful to about 20% of people. I want acupuncturists to understand the necessity for nuanced diagnosis also. I want somatic psychotherapists to get some advice or guidance about how to use their somatic skills. The five elements also give information about emotional presentations, the kind of dynamics of life that will be similar with a person who has that thwarted response in the liver. They're going to have a whole set of emotional responses that relate to longing for benevolence, the counterpart of anger and frustration. I just did a case consult with someone who talked about a patient who clearly was a wood survivor type. This person picked up a a wooden block in her office and just wanted to bang the two wooden blocks together. When I told this therapist that her client needed to go walk amongst trees or go hug a tree, the patient came back the next week and told her that she had gone out hugging trees without the therapist even suggesting it. That person is going to benefit from the energy of a tree because their system has a resonance with the energy of the wood. Functionally, when you're doing your work, do you mix the acupuncture? So you actually have needles in the person. Then do you actually do touch work while they're on the table? Or do you leave the room and let the system do what it's going to do and then come back and do somatic work after the needles are out? Here's my experience. When a person comes and they're in a highly dysregulated state, very much in hyperarousal, If I insert a needle at that point, their tissues are rather tight. The needle will hurt. I'm running the risk of stimulating the energy in their system towards greater arousal. They're going to get pissed off at me. They're going to have pain. Similarly, if their energy is more in a collapsed state, if I insert a needle then, there's no tone in the system to carry the chi that's being stimulated by the needle. I need to use touch techniques or other techniques from somatic experiencing to shift the vector of the chi so that it's moving out of dysregulation and towards regulation, then place a needle so that the needle then stimulates the energy to move in the direction that I've helped it move towards. Depending on the person, I'll help them find that little bit of regulation that moves them towards regulation, then place needles and then use touch work, maybe the kidney adrenal hold, maybe the liver hold, maybe I'll work with the diaphragms. The needle actually gets to be kind of like a third hand. I get to work with multiple diaphragms by placing a needle along this diaphragm and having my hand on that diaphragm. I can be working with the tendons and ligaments, which are the tissue associated with the wood element, using the command point for tendons and ligaments and having my hands around the ankle where those meridians pass through and there are a lot of tendons and ligaments that can be influenced by a thwarted flight response. So when you do the touch work, you actually have a body topology of Chinese medicine. You understand the pathways called meridians through which the qi moves around the body, which for those of you listening who don't know about Chinese medicine, it's similar to the prana from Mm -hmm. Ayurvedic medicine moving through the the hubs, the channels. So I'm imagining when you are doing this touch work, because often when I'm doing Kathy Kane's work, I find myself feeling a difference between tissue movement, muscle movement, ANS movement, and the subtle body movement I'm imagining that when you have this experience, if you do... We're speaking the same language. You have the roadmap of the meridian, so you can see how discharge works in the system from a very specific roadmap. And I'm tremendously interested in the fact that you can do that. I wish I could do that. Well, it sounds like you probably already do to some extent. I'll give you a case example story. So I was doing connective tissue work using the back of the arm where a meridian called the triple heater runs that's particularly associated with the connective tissue on a fellow who had had a lot of surgery in his torso. He had part of his stomach removed and part of his esophagus and ribs broken and resection. I simply had my hand on the back of his arm and my attention on his connective tissue. Before very long, he said, I'm beginning to feel more connected to myself than I have in a long time, and I also feel connected to you. He stayed with that, and then he started to have this kind of shimmering experience go down both of his legs, down the stomach meridian. 
This is the part where I know, but I don't know, because in surgery, his legs had to be strapped down to the table in order to prevent them from moving while they were doing all this delicate work in his guts. We don't know if there was thwarted mobilization of a flight response that was having an opportunity to release through the stomach meridian, or if the surgical abuse, we'll call it, to his stomach organ, the brace and collapse and all of that that was in his stomach organ was having a chance to release through the stomach meridian. But frankly, in Chinese medicine, we don't care. We're not concerned about why or how. We're just concerned with the that. So we know that at the end of that session, he felt more connected to himself, he felt connected to me, and he felt more coherent in his whole body because this release had happened. This is such a beautiful example of how trauma therapists who do touch can unwind medical trauma, which I don't think is discussed a lot. And particularly surgical trauma, where there's a biochemical induction of a freeze response and a major insult. The body doesn't know that you signed a consent and there are surgical steel instruments being used. The body only assumes an attack Helping the body resolve that attack can help facilitate the healing of the surgery. I had a repair surgery on my wrist by an excellent hand surgeon. I had asked her whether or not I could be awake. In the actual surgical procedure, I heard every word the surgeon said. And in fact, many times during the surgery, the surgeon was seeing things in very specific regard to things that I had asked her to do. And my entire system had such a different experience I'm of sure. that surgery. And the healing from that surgery was very fast. That's fabulous. What a great surgeon you worked with. I have a direct sense of what it is like when there is awareness, there is connection during a surgical procedure rather than total freeze and the body in complete state of shock. Right. So in your book, you introduce the concept of mindful touch. And I wanted to give you a chance to describe what that looks like for you when you practice. I think I'm referring to putting my mind in my hand and working with my mind to not leave my hand. Sometimes my mind wants to leave my hand and I have to invite it back over and over again. That brings a level of awareness to what's underneath my hand. I can feel things at the level you described earlier. So it's more of a targeted embodied awareness. Yeah. And sometimes that mindful touch isn't just what's under my hand. It's also what's being influenced by my hand. Like it might be that there's some movement down the leg or, or up the arm or something like that, that my mindful touch is also able to experience. People who come to me have very complex multi-symptom illness resulting from autonomic nervous system dysregulation. I'm able to do relatively small things to help them find greater regulation. The framework of somatic experiencing that allows me to think about concepts like titration, movement between arousal and restoration and resting, those kinds of concepts help my acupuncture to be received more deeply and be less likely to overwhelm a system. Have you thought about teaching? I have a passion for teaching. <laughs> While I was at the Veterans Administration for a couple of years, I did monthly workshops for the staff and taught some of these touch skills to them, again, in the context of the five elements. Then when I left the VA, I've, for the last two years, I've taught a course for acupuncturists, seasonal workshops that are basically the development of the book. And starting in January, I've expanded my course to include somatic experiencing practitioners and SC students, as well as licensed acupuncturists. And we're going to do five two-day workshops in 2019 to go through each of these five seasons and five steps of the threat response, touch approaches that are reflected in those five seasons and five elements. And if people want to find out about the workshops that you're offering, where do they go to do that? They can go to my website, which is integrativehealingworks.net. And do you mostly teach in the D.C. area only? I'm open to travel. Right now, I'm teaching primarily in Silver Spring. I'm also an adjunct faculty member at the Maryland University of Integrative Health, and I teach advanced clinical supervision. Our world is so disturbed by traumatic stress. The divisions and divisiveness that we've seen at play on the national field the violence that we've seen, their expressions of dysregulation arising out of the trauma experiences of these perpetrators, the rise of 
fundamentalism and racist ideology, I think is an expression of the brainstem being frozen by fear. The message that politicians of both parties are giving the American people, be afraid of that other party and trust me, actually puts us all in a very reactive and rigid way of thinking that prevents us from seeing our full humanity and seeing the full humanity of the American people and the world's people. And so we end up making survival-based decisions in the ballot box instead of world healing expressions in the ballot box. I think our nation needs our healers. Healers are a critical part of healing the, the division and the violence we're finding in our neighborhoods. And actually, I think this is a really difficult cultural environment for military personnel to come home to because they already don't feel safe without their unit with them. And then they come into an energetic field of such unsafety. The feeling of unsafety that I'm pointing at is a psychological feeling of disconnection because of rampant individualism. And I would Mm -hmm. have to say that in the context of the conversation you and I are having, the collective ideation of the Taoists and even the Confucianists was not putting an individual on a pedestal. It was actually putting collective welfare first and that individual's primary responsibility was to show up for, contribute to, and generate collective well-being for the community. That's right. And that does really appear to have broken down in my lifetime. I, I had this fellow come in. His jaw was tight. Uh, he complained of pain outside edge of his legs, uh, which is the gallbladder pathway. He was angry, and he was the embodiment of dysregulation in the wood element. As he walked into my treatment room, he was kind of belligerent. I noticed his eyes catch on some flowers that I had on the windowsill. And I said, so I I noticed you saw my flowers. And he said, yeah, it reminds me of my grandfather. I used to garden with my grandfather. Think about your grandfather a little bit. So I noticed that your, your jaw looks a little bit softer. Your face looks a little bit softer as you think about your grandfather. He said, well, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, 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 no. Why don't you just take a minute and notice if there are any ways that you feel even just a little bit safe in this room. And he looked at me with these extraordinary eyes and said, damn, no one's ever invited me to feel safe. I put him on the table. I did a very simple treatment for his liver and gallbladder. He got off the table and he put his ankle over his knee to tie his shoe and said, oh my God, I haven't been able to bend my knee like that since I got home from overseas. The tendons of the ligaments are the associated tissues of the wood element. We would put enough flexibility in those tissues with that simple treatment and that invitation to safety that he had enough regulation that he could let go of some of that grace. And this was somebody who had been a combat veteran? Yeah. I am not sure you have an answer to this question. Maybe five years ago on the West Coast, I was lecturing about moral injury. because that was the point at which the VA and the military were not interested in even thinking there was such a thing as moral injury, no less having treatments for it, which they actually do have now, Right. five years later. I'm interested in whether or not you've done any work with veterans, specifically combat veterans, who come back suffering from moral injury rather than post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes, People who have been raised in highly authoritarian households are more prone to feel comfortable in highly authoritative structures like the military. They are also more vulnerable to moral injury because they're semi-programmed to say yes, sir, to uh, a commanding officer without thinking about what they're being told to do or not do. That was the rule perhaps in their family of origin. And then it's only later that they wake up and say, wait a minute, I think the military is ripe for moral injury experiences. The difference between PTSD and moral injury is PTSD is a loss of basic safety, while moral injury is a loss of basic trust. Trust in oneself, trust in one's superiors who are asking them to do things, or some of the people I've worked with have witnessed things that have occurred either by their own counterparts toward enemy combatants or by enemy combatants toward civilians or toward their own counterparts. 
I'm actually curious whether you've had any experience of this mix of methodologies helping to allow individual to land back into basic trust. That's a complex question. I grappled with this distinction between moral injury and PTSD because it seems like they both manifest as dysregulation. And the same answer of helping restore regulation belongs to both. Is that your sense? But then I love so much, Elaine, about what you're doing is the Chinese methodology, which is much more integrative in and of itself. What I just described is really based on a Western methodology uh -huh. because the treatments for PTSD do not work for moral injury. A lot of the combat vets who came home, particularly from Iraq, especially that second wave, some of them were doing months of PTSD treatment at some of the facilities in Colorado and nothing was working for them, nothing was getting better. And some of the vets I worked with from that cohort, based on some of the experiences that they were telling me about, they didn't have a problem with basic safety. They were having a problem with the trust in themselves, the trust in the world, the trust in any system they might be in. From that methodology, these two things are very different. The treatment is different. But I can see from the dysregulation point of view that the same set of healing skills might have a similar effect. The sort of twist in moral injury is the concept of what Porges and Peter Levine call interoception. I've witnessed this. The child comes into a party. There's a dog there. The dog is woofing in a big way. The dog is like up to the kid's nose. The kid's scared to death. And the mom says, oh no, it's okay, honey. The dog's a nice dog. So the child has just been taught that their own interoceptive understanding of their sense of safety should be ignored. It leads to moral injury because when your commanding officer is raping your fellow uh, soldier, you know it's wrong, but you've been taught not to listen to your interoception until the dark night of the soul comes and your interoception wakes up and says, that was wrong and I let it happen. In Chinese terms, interoception is inviting the chi to return to the tissues. Embodied awareness has left. The healing is bringing embodied awareness back in so that a person has the capacity to find their voice to say, that's wrong and I will stop it because it violates my sense of right and wrong and my own integrity. And that's what gets lost in moral injury is your own integrity, which got lost a long time ago when you weren't allowed to explore your own interoception. So I 100% agree with you. I think some of the more traditional approaches to PTSD that are focused exclusively on safety instead of on embodied awareness miss their opportunity for the nuance of moral injury and its interface with PTSD. Also, I think there is an element here, both with somatic experiencing, but I've also experienced it just with straight acupuncture because mm -hmm. of the heart connection mm -hmm. that you discussed mm -hmm. earlier, that these methodologies appear to give rise to what I call an organismic compassionate response. In order to heal from moral injury, there has got to be a way to compassionately recognize the nature of human suffering yeah. without that sense of, I am a terrible, broken person. Exactly. You know, it's like that old Chinese story. The person goes to the sage and says, I want to understand about suffering. And the sage pours a cup of salt in a glass of water and says, drink this. What do you taste? And the person says, oh, bitter, horrible. Now let's go down to the lake. He pours a cup of salt in the lake and swirls it around and says, now drink this. Oh, it tastes sweet. The container has to be made big enough for people to understand this violation in the context of a bigger world. Yeah. The example I like to think about is military sexual trauma. Traumatic stress in men tends to increase the secretion of testosterone. Rape and sexual trauma, it's a necessary component to war. That is a very bold statement. I will stand behind it. The military ethical code that was recently rewritten would probably disagree with you. The military code is a cognitive approach towards valor and loyalty and integrity and honesty, all those things that are part of the military code that are honorable, but it misses the body. When you subject bodies to horrible, unrelenting, traumatic stress, 
body will take over and it will cause the body to do things it wouldn't do in other circumstances. So that individual service member who commits the rape, obviously this is wrong, <laughs> but we have to understand it in the context of he was living in an intolerable setting. The places you and I have been going today are very complex. And this is another very complex place to go, not because of the military code of ethics, but it's very difficult for me to do this kind of separation, to say that the body is such an instinctual machine that if it gets into a certain condition, it will take over and it will override the mind. I have so many instances where I can say that's exactly what happened for people, but I equally have so many instances right. where a similarly stressed system was actually able to pull itself back from the brink. There are some people who have a more resilient energy body. Mm -hmm. They're able to find of one breath between their instinct and their action, able to stop themselves. Not everyone has that capacity. Indeed. Being a service member and going to combat is not predictive for PTSD. It's not predictive for sexual assault. It's not predictive for any of these things. If they happen, we understand it. The military now has a predictive model of a trauma checklist that they give everyone before they go into the field of war. And I would say one more thing, which I think is really critical as healers. It's all forgivable. If we can't find space in our own heart for forgiveness of perpetrators and understanding what gave rise to their becoming a perpetrator, we can't really offer the full range of healing that's possible for our world. So I'm going to give healers a break. Forgiveness is huge. <laughs> like that goes really beyond the beyond. Those of us who work with people who've really been through difficult circumstances, we must have a frame for the ubiquitousness of human suffering in the human mind. We all have our own brand of human suffering, and therefore, we are all able to compassionately recognize that this occurs. We don't have to go all the way to forgiveness. Right. And I know I have the capacity to liberate myself from that suffering, and I know they do too. That that's right. innate in a human system, is that right. capacity for liberation. I think we can hold an aspirational context of forgiveness and acceptance of the human condition and the human experience. Absolutely. This is the difference between the Judeo-Christian model, that there has to be forgiveness first and then acceptance, and the Eastern model. There just needs to be wise understanding, compassionate, fearless recognition of the primordial nature of human suffering, and to work to alleviate it no matter when it arises, no matter where it arises. Depends on your interpretation of the Judeo-Christian view. One view says that Jesus died for the forgiveness of sins, that his death opened up an era for humanity that includes the forgiveness of everything. The more revolutionary interpretation of Christianity includes radical forgiveness. It does. It's also a liberation theology. That's right. And in that way, it absolutely meets the Buddhist and Vedic perspective around human capacity for awakening. I mean, all the religious systems are different cultural expressions of the human being's longing to understand what's beyond understanding. And let's both acknowledge that Chinese medicine actually mm -hmm. brings an understanding Western medicine doesn't have yes. that really allows Western medicine to work better. I think so. And the more that we can be in integration instead of opposition with Western medicine providers, our patients benefit from living in an era and a time when they can have the best of both worlds. You know, when I started in practice back in the late 80s, people came to acupuncturists after they'd been to every other physician and as a last resort. Now they come to us first and say, do you think I need to see a doc? That's a big transition in our patient population. I am one of those people. If I get sick, I go to see my acupuncturist. And then it, the burden is on the acupuncturist to discern, yes, I think you need to see a doctor, or I think I can help you with this. Well, I am so excited about your work. I'm so excited about the Tao of Trauma. This is such a gift to so many of us who have intuited something like this, mm -hmm. but certainly do not have the knowledge you have, nor the ability to tell someone like me how to actually implement. So this interview feels like it's been, you know, around the block and through the woods. And is this how they all go? 
Yes, usually it goes into a wide territory, but actually this one was very targeted, I thought, in terms of explaining the methodology and why you would be doing what you were doing. We were just very fortunate because, you know, you work with the military and with vets. So Uh we were able to go places. Normally I can't go with people. Because we share that. And I think it's really important for people who work with trauma, first of all, to know that if they don't have a frame for working with military vets, they should not be doing it. You telling people all the experiences you've had, they will get that. Before we finish, is there anything you really want listeners to know that we haven't talked about? I'm certified through the SE Institute for case consultations and personal sessions through the advanced level. I'm happy to do sessions for people out of town, out of state. And I'm very interested in traveling and bringing this information to communities of healers outside of Washington, D.C. I am a firm believer in creating regulation in communities. So I want to be a contributing force in creating more regulation in our world. Well, I cannot thank you enough. Well, I feel like I found a friend. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's show. To get in touch, please visit groundlessground.com. Let's dedicate our efforts to the healing of our planet and all its inhabitants. See you next time on the Groundless Ground.